Muhammad Ali is without a doubt the greatest boxer of all time. There have been better punchers, boxers with better records or more victories, but nobody had what Ali brought to the table. He was a phenomenal champion, the greatest entertainer, and the leading activist for human rights amongst all athletes. Here's the life story of one Muhammad Ali and our take on his greatness. His boxing, his great service to humanity, his famous trash talk, but also his stepping out of line and stubbornness that kept him in the ring for too long. Early Life and Boxing Beginnings Born in Kentucky in 1942, Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. grew up in the American South in a time of severe racial segregation. His father, Cassius Clay Sr., supported a wife and two sons by painting billboards, while his mother worked as a household domestic. Growing up poor and racially oppressed, young Cassius quickly learned he'd have to fight for everything in life. When his bike was stolen at the age of 12, he told a police officer, Joe Martin, that he wanted to beat up the thief. As a twist of fate would have it, Joe Martin was also a boxing trainer at the local gym, and he invited the young man to come train there and learn how to fight before he started beating up people on the street. It's kind of like how Mike Tyson fell into it. He was like, you know, in the streets and stuff. And then after that fight, when the bully uh, killed his pigeon in front of him, he got invited into a gym to oppress his anger and to, you know, take it out in the boxing form. I feel like a lot of these uh, legends and goats fell into boxing they by accident. They hardship as well. Hardship, they and they, they, they didn't, the they wasn't born with the mindset that I'm going to be a boxer. Yeah, they didn't have a dad who was a boxer. It. From that moment on, everything would change in the life of Cassius Clay. He just didn't know it yet. He won his first amateur fight at the age of 14, and two years later, he won a novice Golden Gloves tournament at light heavyweight. At the age of 19, Clay was the winner of the National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions and the winner of AAU national title for the light heavyweight division. As the best amateur in the country, Clay was selected to represent the USA in 1960 Rome Olympics, which he almost refused due to his fear of flying. Standing oh. at six foot three, Fast and athletic, Clay was dominant in the Olympic tournament, and he deservedly won the gold medal after beating the Polish Zbigniew Piotrkowski in the final. Return home and start of a professional career. Now an Olympic champion. Imagine he didn't go because of the flight. What was his name before? Clay. Clay? Oh, then he reverted into Islam, then became Muhammad mm, Ali. Exactly. I see. Yeah, because he took his faith seriously. Yeah. Um, but imagine he didn't go on that flight and he just said that nah, because of my fear of flying. He would have never got to like, or he might have got to here, but in a different way. Mm. But like that really set his career up. Mm. Clay returned home and proudly wore his medal around Kentucky. He went on to eat downtown, but couldn't get served in a restaurant. We don't serve Negroes, the waiter oh. said. I don't eat Negroes too. Just bring me a hamburger. A quick-witted boxer replied, disgusted and disappointed. He thought something was deeply wrong in the country, where his dad fought in wars, and he won the Olympic gold, but still wasn't treated as equal. Cassius turned pro after 105 amateur fights, winning exactly 100 of them. He signed a deal with Louisville. He won 100 out of 105 fights. That's crazy record. I didn't realize he'd done that many amateur fights. That's a lot to like, a lot of people don't get me wrong. They have a lot of amateur fights, but they have like 20, 15, he had 105 amateur fights. That's mad. What a G. And his first contract was $400 a month, plus 50% of the gate. Clay then made another career altering move and called the Fifth Street Gym in Miami, where Angelo Dundee was the head coach. He moved to Florida and immediately began training with Dundee who would be in his corner for all but two career fights. Cassius was still a teenager with an unpolished skill set and not all the way physically developed as a heavyweight, weighing less than 190 pounds. Still, his speed proved to be too much for all his opponents, and he fought more like a middleweight than a proper heavyweight. But neither his agility nor an Olympic gold medal was his most prominent feature. Clay got known for his trash talk, which he picked up from the professional wrestler Gorgeous George Wagner, whom he met in 1961 at the beginning of his boxing career. Clay re trash talk sells. Look at Conor McGregor, all these guys. When you master the trash talk, you will sell a fight. And he done that back then. Trash talking made a difference in the number of sold tickets. And because it aligned with his confident and Just humorous nature, Cassius adopted the tactic and soon began slandering and belittling every opponent. <laughs> After he knocked out the European heavyweight champion Henry Cooper at the Wembley Stadium in England, there was only one man left to beat. That's where we, well, that's near where I grew up. I grew up near Wembley Stadium. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, so Northwest London. So Muhammad Ali was in the old school Wembley Stadium before they rebuilt it. 
That's crazy. That building is famous then. Yeah, it's famous for loads of yeah. things, but I didn't think it went. I didn't think they'd done like Muhammad old school Ali Muhammad there. Ali yeah. fights. Do you know what I mean? The world, Sonny Liston, becoming the champ. Liston was truly a lesson in what the physical advantages mean in boxing. Although only six foot and one inch tall, he had an incredible 84 inch reach and massive fists. Liston had an amazing jab and could knock out a fighter with either hand. He was also strong as a bull, and with the record of 35 and one coming into the fight with Clay, he was considered an eight to one favorite. Clay had just started coming into his own as a popular figure, and Liston was his first major target. Sayings like, if you like to lose your money, be a fool and bet on Sonny, endeared him to many, but his trash talk wasn't universally accepted, and some people viewed him as a disrespectful jokester. Clay's offensive began during Liston's preparations for the match with Floyd Patterson. Clay appeared at his practices, public appearances, and annoyed the hell out of the guy. He called him an ugly bear and pointed out that a champion should be beautiful, like him. His propaganda- There's a guy, I forgot his name, the Let's Go Champ Boxer. The champion at the time was Klitschko before Anthony Joshua beat him. And this guy would literally do what Muhammad Ali, he would show up to wherever he's eating in restaurants, he would show up to his camps, he would just annoy the hell out of him. Um, I think he lost though, <laughs> he didn't win, but um, yeah, I guess it's, a way of getting into the opponent's mind and building emotion and anger so that way they're just not thinking about their technique in boxing. They just want to kill this guy in the ring, but that's what makes you lose because you're not thinking about the skill. You're not thinking, smart. You're, not thinking yeah. smart, you're just thinking aggressive. Using as it was something never seen before, but many thought his antics were just an empty threat and figured Clay would only last a couple of rounds, just like all the others. However, trash talking worked like a charm. And when the bell finally sounded off and the fight started, Sonny Liston attacked Cassius Clay as if he was trying to decapitate him. Liston missed shot after shot, wasting a lot of energy. And it was something similar to the first round of Stip Miocic versus Francis Ngannou, if you're a UFC fan. Liston was a big bear who came out to tear limbs with his paws like in The Revenant. But unfortunately for him, he was in the ring with a ballet dancer. Big-bodied Liston didn't have the speed to catch Clay, who hit his opponent with quick combinations with his usual risky style and somehow managed to avoid anything thrown at him. Cassius Clay was at the height of the first phase of his career, in which he masterfully used his speed and agility. Liston looked more frustrated than ever, and Clay was winning every round. However, wow. things started to turn around when Clay temporarily lost his sight during the fourth round and even wanted to give up and asked his coach to untie his gloves. Dundee tried to wash Clay's eyes and motivate him. And when the gong marked the start of the fifth round, Dundee had to literally push Clay to the center of the ring. Liston saw that and went for all or nothing. Due to poor diet, alcohol, and lack of training, he had only a few minutes of strength left to bring down the annoying challenger. However, Clay remained standing, and whatever it was in his eyes evaporated during the fifth round, and he returned in the sixth. I think his adrenaline just fixed his eyesight. Mm. Once you're getting punched at, then you just snap out of things. When you're pumped with adrenaline, you don't feel anything. Yeah. And, and I when think, you start relaxing, that's when everything kicks in. I think when he, the eye thing, once he sat down, he realized his vision's fucked, but yeah. then when he got back in and punches are getting thrown at him again, he just sorted fight it out. Fight or flight. Yeah, fight or flight, yeah. that's it. Sixth, reborn and ready to win. The 22-year-old challenger dominated Liston in the sixth, after which the champ collapsed in his chair, spat out his mouth guard, and said that he was done. The fight was over, and boxing wow. had a new heavyweight champion. I'm so bad, I'm so pretty, I shook up the world. Clay shouted into the microphone in what would be his last fight under his birth name. Becoming Ali, celebrity status, and Vietnam protest. Two days after becoming the heavyweight champ, Clay shocked the boxing world again by announcing that he had accepted the teachings of the Nation of Islam. Two weeks later, he took the name Muhammad Ali, which was given to him by his spiritual mentor, Elijah Muhammad. Even though he changed the name, nothing changed in the ring. For the next three years, Ali completely dominated heavyweight boxing, just like Marciano and Joe Lewis did before him. And so he is technically classed as a middleweight boxer, but he no. was knocking out. He was a heavyweight boxer in weight, but he was a small heavyweight, so like, because he was young, he wasn't fully developed like these big heavyweights. Like yeah. He was like 21, 22. But he fought the way he would fight. He was very light on his feet. He wasn't heavy footed. He wasn't a power puncher. He wasn't like a Mike Tyson who's just one punching people. He was really quick on his feet, really mm -hmm. elegant. They called him a ballet dancer in the ring and move like a butterfly, sting like a bee. That's his motto where it's all about movement and thing. And these people that are heavy, if they're not landing those shots, they're getting tired. He basically ties them down. He's just hitting them quick, quick move, quick move. 
And then eventually he's getting the win mm. and he's not always knocking them down. They're just exhausted. Mm. So although he's a heavyweight in weight, because he is a heavyweight, he's not fighting like a heavyweight. He's, he's all about light. speed and technique yeah. and stuff, yeah. Free match against Liston. He triumphed after the phantom knockout in first round in one oh, of wow. the most controversial fights of all time, since many believed Liston threw the fight. After that, Ali defended his title eight more times and was never in danger of getting beat. He was in his physical prime and a class above everybody else. He was indeed flying like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. Yeah. And nobody was able to stop the famous Ali shuffle. Nobody in the ring, at least. In 1967, citing his religious beliefs, Ali refused induction into the U.S. Army at the height of the war in Vietnam. Unlike most athletes who wouldn't dare speak up against the government, Ali was intelligent and brave enough to fight for his beliefs and not back down. I don't want to quarrel with no Viet Cong. They haven't done anything to me. They never called me a n as he did not want to enlist in the army. It's so true. Like he's saying they didn't call him a N. Why would he go up to kill them? His own people were calling him that word, you know. He went to the restaurant, ordered food, they said, so they Get out. So why the yeah. hell would he fight for these people who are calling him that word and yeah. disrespect him like that? Army. The champ was threatened with imprisonment. Standing before a completely white jury, Ali was sentenced to five years in prison and a ten thousand dollar fine. Since the appeal was filed, because he didn't attend the war. Yeah, because you know if you get called out, like in certain countries, even till this day, like in uh, Middle Eastern countries, like if you hit a certain age, like sixteen, and they basically summon you to war, you have to go. You go to prison otherwise. It's not like that back home in my country. You know what? Five years prison is better than a bullet to the head. Let's be honest. Than dying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, if you're actually in the war, that's mad. Mm. Immediately, and the bail was paid. Ali did not go to prison, but was stripped of his world title and boxing license and would not have an official boxing match for three and a half years. They stole the three best years of his career. When he was at his peak, he could not box, said his legendary coach, Angelo Dundee, and he was right. However, that injustice only put more wood to the fire and gave Ali another title, that of a people's champ. Returning to boxing and the fight of the century, people's champ. Ali's case went to the Supreme Court who ruled it unanimously in his favor, and he was eligible to return to the ring. He defeated Jerry Quarry and Oscar Bonavena in two largely uneventful fights, which served as an hors d'oeuvre for the main dish, oh. which was Joe Frazier. Dubbed the fight of the century, it was the first time in history that two undefeated heavyweight boxing champions met in the ring. In Ali's absence, Frazier became the most dominant fighter in the world, who destroyed everybody with his quick movement and disastrous left hook. Both fighters were in their prime years. Frazier was 27 and Ali was 29. The marketing for the fight was something never seen before in the world of boxing. Ali was a master marketer and he positioned himself as the embodied- The trash talk. Uh, at some point, we'll react to Muhammad Ali's trash talk. I think that'll be a good watch. Mm. He meant black discontent. And for the success of the campaign, the opponent had to become the embodiment of the problem. As Frazier was also black, Ali started calling him Uncle Tom. The derogatory name for racial traitors <gasps> involved in white oh. oppression pushed Frazier- There's another word for that now. They, I think the word coon is used at times. Such a nasty word. And it's basically your own people calling you that because you're basically saying you traded us and you're doing shit for their entertainment and you, making yourself look like a clown for them mm. like to be accepted by them rather than want to be like a us. part of us yeah. so it's a really it's a really harsh word to use uh, Uncle Tom I've never heard that one that's probably the old school version um, but yeah that is not even getting support from your own people yeah that probably triggers him like mad. Yeah. Vengeful psychosis, yeah. from which he did not recover for the next 30 years. Ali's rhyming propaganda united the black community against Frazier, and his family received threats on a daily basis. Joe's kids were bullied at school, and at the height of preparations for the match, Frazier was guarded by the- It's quite sad though, because just because of the uh, hype of the fight and obviously being called that and it became such a big thing that he started getting death threats and started getting his kids bullied and stuff. It's quite peak that Muhammad Ali put him in that position. But I guess with Ali, he calls out what he sees. And if he's, you know, I don't know how Fraser was, if he was what an Uncle Tom is, you know, a white person pleaser, if that's what you want to call it. I guess, you know, he got called out on it and shit hit the fan and people supported it. And, you know, if it wasn't true, not so many people would get behind it, I guess. Yeah, you only, people only react if there's evidence behind something. You're not going to go blindly and say, yeah, you are this. 
maybe it's something that a lot of people wanted to say but no one had the balls to and then Muhammad Ali boom and then it just triggered everyone to be like yeah we've been saying this for ages or whatever it's quite sad on the children yeah because kids are nothing to do with it (laughs) police apart from that Ali was also calling him ugly a gorilla and generally tried to make him look bad in any way he could (laughs) on March 8th 1971 Muhammad Ali confidently stepped into the sacred Madison Square Garden when the people's champion came for his stolen gold opposite of him stood the seething Joe Frazier, who was finally in the place where he could retaliate Ali's verbal abuse in the best way he knew how, with his fists. Before his suspension, Muhammad Ali was elusively fast and relied more on his athletic ability than on his fighting intelligence. He wasn't by any means slow during his first match with Frazier, but he wasn't dancing like Fred Astaire anymore. Because of his arrogance, Ali refused to adapt to the athleticism loss, which was everything Frazier needed. Slightly slower Ali, combined with Frazier's rage and unwillingness to loosen the pressure, enabled Smoke and Joe to catch Ali too many times. This fight will be remembered by precise hooks, followed by combinations to the body and a tireless act from Frazier, who always kept on coming. Ali later said he was hit more in that fight than in his last six fights combined. In round 15, Frazier threw a hook that finally sent Muhammad Ali to the ground and gave him the first serious career knockdown. He was able to get up, but Frazier was a clear winner and had won the fight via unanimous decision. Frazier had a lot of anger held back. And this time, because Ali, like they said, couldn't keep up because he slowed down in that part of his career, that's literally the perfect situation for Frazier. Do you think he slowed up because he had the three-year gap or he just became very cocky? Probably a bit of both. Yeah. A mixture of both, I think. Fire in the belly and regaining the title back. The loss to Frazier pissed Ali off. It changed his approach to life and sports and put him back on the road to the title. He built himself a rugged training camp near a lake in Pennsylvania to limit himself from the modern world's distractions and luxuries. Ali was more motivated than ever, and he trained twice as hard. Running every day, chopping trees, and boxing, he was ready to right the wrong. In the next two years, Ali fought often and had won 10 fights in a row. Then in 1973, he suffered another loss to a little-known fighter, Ken Norton who broke Ali's jaw in the second round en route to a 12-round upset decision. Ali downplayed his opponent and didn't take him seriously. Ali was often playing in the ring and would have his hands down or just shuffle around for a few rounds, not really throwing punches. Before the Norton fight, he didn't train properly and had spent more time with women than he did with Angelo Dundee. He had a nice little cushion around his belly, weighing more than 220 pounds. I've been winning fights so easily and a man can get intoxicated, not only with narcotics or alcohol, but a man can also get intoxicated with greatness. And that's what happened. I was so good that I started to do things I wouldn't normally do, Ali said after the loss. Another rail sobered him up again, and Ali returned six months later with- Sometimes a person needs a- Reality check. Reality check, a big loss or big knockdown, just to wake them back up and say, you know what, like, I need to fix up or this ain't gonna happen. Mm. Weight, weighing 210 pounds, the same weight he had versus Sonny Liston. The rematch was really close, and the decision was somewhat controversial, but Ali successfully avenged the loss and defeated Norton by a split decision. After that, the time had come to avenge his first loss against Frazier, even though it wasn't for the title, because Joe lost it to George Foreman. In the second fight, again at MSG, Ali was able to secure the decision victory over Frazier in a vastly better performance than the first time they collided. After the win, he finally came to the position he so desperately craved, to fight for the world's heavyweight championship. The Rumble in the Jungle Coming to the fight with Ali, George Foreman had amassed 40 professional victories in the same number of fights. He had won only three by decision, and the vast majority of his fights ended in the- You know the Foreman grill? That's him. George Foreman. That's his brand? Yeah, that's him, yeah. What? That's his brand, George Foreman grill. There's a movie on it that came out to cinema recently. So George Foreman was a professional boxer, world champion, and he made the Foreman grill and that blue. And that's what people are using till this day. Wow. Yeah, that's mad, isn't it? <laughs> First three rounds, including dominant victories over Frazier and North. Did you like cooking then? I'm guessing he must He must have. do. He Why must would you make a, a grill of all things? <laughs>
important. They had both beaten Ali, but lasted only two rounds with Foreman. Nobody thought Ali would stand much chance against the hardest hitting man the world had ever seen, who was also seven years younger than Ali and in his physical prime. Of course, Ali thought differently and trash talked George in the buildup, creating an enormous interest in the fight. Dictator Mobutu paid $10 million for the match to be held in Kinshasa in October 1970. So he paid $10 million for that fight to happen in his country. That's crazy. He knew the tourist attraction and he must have been a Muhammad Ali fan Money as well. Money for the country. Yeah, that's a big say. The fight was originally set in August, but due to Foreman's cut in sparring, it was postponed for six weeks, and both fighters stayed in Zaire. Ali was followed by tens of thousands of people at every step. He hugged and kissed children, women, the elderly, went everywhere without security. On the other hand, Foreman mostly frowned and was followed by his German Shepherd, which was a huge mistake. The slave owners in Zaire used such dogs, and this completely turned the local population against George, who shouted, Ali, Bomaye, which meant Ali, kill him. When the fight was approaching, uh. Ali's coaches were genuinely afraid for his life against such a terrifying puncher. The plane was ready to transfer Ali to Madrid if the injuries after the fight would be too severe. However, that would not be necessary, as Ali was able to shock the world again. Instead of dodging the blows and moving around the ring, Ali leaned on the ropes and tried to protect his head and suffered incredibly strong blows to his body. Foreman punched and punched, but Ali kept standing against the ropes. In almost insane ecstasy, he yelled at Foreman in between the punches. Only one man on the planet, amid a life and death struggle, can utter something as ridiculous and daunting as, is that all you got, George? And continue <laughs> to fight. Foreman started to get incredibly tired, and then Ali shifted from his rope adobe defense and began fighting back. The combination of five blows to the head, spiced with a right hook, was enough to knock out the big George Foreman and brought all the spectators into delirium. He shot the world because he'd done a different tactic. So he'd done the rope a dope a lot, which was like leaning on the ropes. And it worked. I don't think he expected it. He probably thought he was going to stick to his normal style. He's been doing every fight. I think he just caught him off guard. He didn't train for that type of Muhammad Ali. Ali was the champion again. I am honored to be mentioned in the same sentence as him. He is the greatest of all time, and he outwitted me and outboxed me, George said after the match. Until his license was revoked, Ali was known as an elusive fighter. You couldn't push him into a corner. You couldn't shorten the ring against him. He always forced opponents into a counter rhythm and hit them in the head from incredible angles. Upon his return, Ali stunned the world and even his coaches with his ability to withstand blows from the baddest hitters on the planet, Foreman and Frazier. Thrilla in Manila. After he won the belt, he defended it three times in 1975, after which he squared off against Frazier for the third time. The score was tied between the two, and the hatred was still there. Both men wanted the trilogy. Thrilla in Manila will be remembered for inhumane conditions of 40 degrees Celsius and humidity that knocked out people in the stands. That fight showed what human will and determination could do. Frazier was filled with hatred for Ali and determined to finally show he was better. Ali was far from the ideal shape, with an obvious excess weight, but with self-confidence that nobody else had. Each round was a total war. They say the styles make up every good boxing match, and these two styles were perfectly appealing. Frazier hit Ali in the head like no one, precisely, seemingly every time, and Ali countered with uppercuts that closed both of Frazier's eyes. In the twelfth round, Frazier could hardly see anything, and his face looked like porridge. The man fought almost completely blind, but didn't want to give up. However, before the start of the fifteenth round, Frazier's coach Eddie Futch physically prevented his fighter from going out on the gong. I couldn't let him die in my arms. I just couldn't. This is the class mad. It's because it was 40 degrees. You know how hot that is. They said people were passing out in the stands, let alone you're fighting and intense, and you're both out to take each other's heads off. Like Fraser, you're hated both that. exhausted from the heat already. Yeah. Then you're using the energy that you have remaining in your body competitively. What? 1v1 in a ring and Fraser hated Ali for what mm. happened in the past so he was not giving up the coach done the right thing because if it was like that you know if he let him go fight that final round and he died out of exhaustion or you know that can happen that death would have been the responsibility of the, the coach. coaches and mm -hmm. the people because his team needs to look out for him. Mm -hmm. So they, I think they've done the right thing. Just to dying I've ever felt in my life, Muhammad said after the match, I hit him with punches that would knock down a wall and he stayed on his feet. Wow. God is my witness. He's a great champion. Frazier said in the locker room, final career years, making history with third title. Ali said that it was too painful and that he might get a heart attack how exhausted he was and that he wants to retire while he was still on top. 
and that's exactly what he should have done. However, he was the champ, and at the height of his fame and earning power, by that time, he was boxing mainly for financial reasons. He didn't need the money himself, but he was donating up to 80% of the fight purses to those in need. After Frazier, he gained more weight and was getting up in age, but he was skilled enough to notch a few more victories. The chatter about him hanging up the gloves was louder and louder, and Ali kept saying he'll retire, but then he would change his mind and strap the gloves back on again. But if you fight long enough, you will lose, no matter how great you are. For Ali, it happened in the form of Leon Spinks, who gave Ali his third career loss in 1978. Every defeat gave Ali extra motivation, and he wanted to prove that he is still not done yet and regain the title in a rematch. He did just that and became the first man wow. to win the heavyweight championship on three separate occasions. After the fight, he retired and relinquished his titles, but then unretired two years later, fighting his old sparring partner, Larry. I think once he retires, he just, you know, he's got all this money, he probably just gets bored of it. And she's like, you know what? I want to go back in he's the He's like, ring. what do I do now? Yeah. Let me just go fight again. You know what though? Muhammad Ali, he fought more than a lot of professional boxers mm -hmm. currently. Like he's on 109 amateur fights. All of these fights over the years, like he's probably up there within the top boxers of who fought the most. And that's probably why he got in the condition he did after his boxing career. And then Trevor Burbick in 1981. He lost both fights and didn't resemble the man who he was before. Early signs of Parkinson's were already there and his movement, speech, and coordination were already impaired. Legacy. After his boxing career was finally over, Ali still continued to fight. He was fighting for peace, tolerance, and equality. Ali was a dancer and a poet who just happened to punch people for a living. And while his punches and shuffle brought victories and his trash-talking rhymes brought him fame, his most important fights were for justice. And his best words were when he was talking about race and inequality that black people have to go through. Yes, Ali enjoyed the bright lights, the women, money, and everything that comes with it. But he never forgot where he came from, and he always fought for the people. That's why he was the people's champ. And despite his illness, Ali didn't hate boxing for what it did to him. He loved it for what it had done for him. He was the most charismatic boxer ever, and combined with his success in the ring and social activism, we consider him the greatest athlete of all time. Oh, did you see his hand? Parkinson's, it, it ruined his life. You know, what he done for humanity and all these things made him the GOAT. The thing is, he was a great boxer, but what made Muhammad Ali the greatest and what we call a legend is what he's done for humanity, his upbringing. He done it in the time where black people were the most oppressed um, and he, you know, came from the dirt, really. He fought against... Uh, going to fight in the army where no one would ever dare to do that before. He took imprisonment. He took imprisonment. Instead he stood his of ground. Of fighting people that didn't take Support the piss him. out of him. Yeah. He put his feet down and that's why people respect him and, you know, give him all the credit that he deserves. But yeah. You know what? Muhammad Ali is a fine example of you have talent. He's got talent. Mm. However, because he got cocky mm. and because he'll stop training... When he'll jump in the ring and he'll lose as much is because he's not being consistent with the training. Mm. So even though you have talent, you have to be consistent. And work hard in yes. the training. But yeah, and he he's someone that didn't give up though. He fought so much. And when he did lose, he made sure he got the win back so in the rematch. Check. Yeah. It just woke him up and reminded him to get back in the ring properly. But yeah, guys, let us know what else you want us to react to. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. The better our channel does, the more content you guys will get. But for now, peace out. Bye.